All right, party people, welcome back to the channel. I hope everybody is well. It is your boy, BQ. And a kick out. This is your Impact Lounge TNA Impact Review for November 14th, 2024. Again, welcome back to the channel. If it's your first time here, hit that subscribe button. We're talking TNA each and every week. Have We have fun here. I'm very honest when I talk about the product. If it's good, I'll say it's good. If it's bad, I'll say it's bad. That's the way we get down here on the channel. It is a no TNA mark zone. No TNA marks allowed. Just the fans who want to see this company grow and succeed and who want to be re who, who are realistic when they watch this product. Before I get into this review, I wanted to say that uh, you guys have not been seeing my face for the last like six or seven weeks on these podcasts. My face will be back next week. I was kind of having a storage issue in the area that I record here. Everything is good to go. Still under construction a little bit, but my face will be back next week on these podcasts. When I do my next uh, Maple Leaf Pro Maple Leaf Pro reaction, because I only reacted to night one, um, it's a difficult watch for me. I'm not going to lie to you. So uh, I still got to get through night two. And I'm going to give a quick reaction. When I do that podcast, you're not going to see my face just for the sake of continuity. Um, with how I did the first episode, but going forward with everything else, I will be back on here when I'm doing my podcasts. So let's get into this episode one time for your mind. Another decent show. I, you know, the crowd was amazing for this and it looked and sounded good. So it it's easy to enjoy the episodes when that's the case. As far as like what we saw on screen, there were some good matches and it was just, it was it was okay. I don't think it was a bad episode by any means, but I'm watching this and you know, I, I still catch clips of AEW here or there on like Facebook. If I'm scrolling, something looks kind of interesting, I'll hit play. And you know, there was even this kind of went viral the other day, but it was so quiet when John Moxley was cutting a promo the other day and you could hear a fan yell at him, go back to Roman. And that had gone viral. But I, I come across these clips sometimes, and you 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 know, they run these large arenas with two thousand people there, and it sounds like they're in an empty arena. And then you turn on impact, and you know, they got this was I believe they're still in Detroit here, so they kind of got a bound for glorious card. There's definitely a, at least eight hundred people there. It looks very, very full, and it just it sounds great, you know. And I'm I'm not talking about production quality wise sounds great. I just mean for a large, energetic, engaged crowd, like it sounds great. And uh, a podcast I started listening to was the Coach and Bro Show with Vince Russo and Jonathan Coachman. And this past episode, uh, Vince Russo was out of pocket, but Jonathan Coachman was doing the podcast with someone else, and he actually shouted out TNA saying, "Right now they're they're doing better as far as crowds." You know, he acknowledged that it's a smaller crowd, but they're running appropriate size arenas and just pointing out the fact that it it looks better. And it really does. It I, I never thought in my lifetime that I would say an episode of TNA looked better than what AEW is doing. But it it really is. So I think that's something happy about because we sat through a lot of years where we were obsessing over how many people were there. I mean, we still have people that obsess over how many people are there, but I mean, you know, when I first started podcasting and they were on pop TV and they were doing a new set of tapings, everyone is like really concerned how many people are there because we knew on a good night, they had 300 people. I've told the story before, you know, 2015 or whatever it was, I went to bound for glory and then I stayed for uh, one night of tapings. And I just cannot, and this is the year, the night that Eddie Edwards beat Lashley for the title. And I just cannot believe how few people were in there. And I was, I remember being scared to death how it was going to come off on TV. And they always found a way to, to make it work. You know, the cameras were very, very careful with how they shot the crowd back then. So it didn't look too bad. But when, I, when I'm telling you there was 150, 150 people there, that's what was there. It was like empty. It was, it was actually pretty embarrassing. This, the section I was sitting in off camera, I was the only person. It was just me and my family. And that was it. We were not sitting by anybody. We had 
it was us and we had, you know, two, three empty rows in front of us, two, three empty rows behind us. So it's great to see where the company is coming. And it actually bothers me when I see uh, on social media, on, I see it on Facebook quite a bit because that's where I'm on for the most part. I, I saw it this morning, as a matter of fact, someone's all oh, TNA did Scott Demore dirty. And, and, you know, I've tried to engage in conversation with these people, but they don't know who I am and, and what I do and what my connections are. And then I start arguing with somebody that I don't know. And I don't do that on social media. Like you're, You'll you'll see me throw a couple of jabs at someone, but then I I walk away. Like I'm not ricochet and sit there and fucking read all the comments and replies and responses and reply to every single one. Like I'm not like that. But I've done it once before on Facebook, where I was like, "Well, no, actually, Scott was fired for job performance and this and this." And of course, someone's like, "Well, how the hell do you know?" And well, it turns out I was like, "Well, I'm I'm pretty connected in the company." And then it it just turns into we'll prove it and. Um, if you know, then why isn't it public information and just, just stupid shit. You know what I mean? So now I just kind of ignore that stuff, but it still kind of bothers me when someone's, you know, the, the comment was cause Mike Bailey is leaving. So someone's like, Oh, everyone's leaving. Cause Scott Demore was fired. And it's kind of like, we know that's not true, right? Us people who really, really watch the show know that that is incorrect. And I have told you it's incorrect. I have, I've given you as much inside information as I'm allowed to give in regarding to Scott's termination. And I reacted just like everyone else in the beginning when it came to Scott, just like everyone else. I had the same reaction, but I, you know, I later learned that it was legit job performance. And it's one thing when I say it, when it happens, but now we're like several months into this thing you guys see the show is better without Scott there. You guys see there's more people talking on social media. You see that there's more people in the crowds. There's a more positive buzz about the company. That has been since Scott is gone. It, it wasn't even like that for Hard to Kill. We had a great um, crowd for Hard to Kill, but it was still like Impact Wrestling with a big audience. You know what I'm saying? Like once they, they got Scott out of there, they had to, once they fired him, they had to do, I think a whole set of tapings with his creative still because they didn't have time to, to uh, switch it up. That was the Orlando one where the, the momentum seemed to, to die for about six weeks, you know, after, after the initial hard to kill. And then it started picking up again. And we know that the, the company has been in a better place without him, you know? So let's get into this episode here. Folks, again, I, I thought it was was okay. You know, I didn't think it was a bad episode. I, I thought it was fairly easy to get through. But let's get into it. It once again took Tom Hannafin about five seconds to say, Bound for glory. We're not going to make fun of Tom this episode, though, so don't worry. Opening match was Mike Santana. That's nasty. Versus half of economy class. Casey Navarro. But I am telling you right now, that motherfucker, that motherfucker back there is not real. And you're a f goof ref. Are you one of those challenge kids? The doctor said I could be on the spectrum. I don't know what that is, but get off of pronto. Tom Hannafin lets us know that this is a first time ever matchup. No fucking shit. No shit. Okay. It's Mike Santana versus Casey Navarro. No shit. So they're doing a very good job of making Mike Santana look very strong. He's not involved in the title picture whatsoever. I have been saying this and I will die on this hill. The company, I haven't been told this to make it clear. This is opinion. The company wants him to be the world champion. Don't think for a second. They signed this dude. This isn't some dude. At least I'm under the impression he was signed. I don't believe he's on a, a per appearance deal. Like he's not Nick Nemeth. I, I promise you, he was ch promised a world title run. The Joe Hendry thing is throwing a big wrench in things. They are doing a very, very good job of keeping him strong and keeping him away from the title picture. And that's that's freaking the wrestling I grew up off, of, folks. 
that that's what I grew up watching. Someone you know that you know wrestler X is going to challenge for the Intercontinental Champion in eight uh, championship in eight months. Let's not tease that he's going to challenge for the title, but let's build him off to the side. Let's build him very strong so that when we get to that point, it makes sense. And I think that's what they're doing with Mike Santana. You know, Telegraph and Tom and these motherfuckers, they're always going to let you know what's what's going to happen in the future. And and this is this is the one time that they're just building someone. He's just off to the side doing his own thing, racking up good wins cutting good promos the video packages are good he's just off to the side doing it and when his time comes it's, he's going to be a legitimate challenger for the the championship so um they're still going with the he's the first person to beat every member of the system and someone in the comments referred to the time that he went in the locker room and beat them all up by himself yes i understand that but i don't think that's what they're referring to they're trying to say he beat every single member one on one but he didn't beat Brian Myers. It was a no it was a a no contest. Anyway, those are just, you know, small small details. Every time Mike Santana wrestles, the crowd is into it. He has a cool factor that most wrestlers don't have because most wrestlers who get into wrestling are not cool. They're like in real life, not cool. They can play a character on TV because wrestling is not cool, folks. I'm, I'm not. If we're just being perfectly honest, like you cannot go on a date right now and be like, "Oh, I, I watch wrestling," and that's awesome. Man, this had to have been 2013 or something. I I went on a date. It was the only time I ever brought up wrestling for whatever reason. Uh, I remember I was not really into the date, and I was just trying to talk about anything. I was just trying to like just to break up the silence and it turned into you know oh yeah i watch wrestling and i remember her first reaction was that's that fake shit that's stupid you know i mean trust me i didn't i never saw the chick after that but um because the whole date was actually very very sarcastic humor on her part but yeah she just immediately how you know that shit is so fake how stupid you know, so there's still people out there that think that wrestling is not cool. Most of us are not cool that watch it. Most of the wrestlers are not cool. You know what I mean? There are a few, Mike Santana being one of them. So we're watching it and then people want to be him. They want to be like him. And they, you know, he the energy he brings is very positive for the company. So... This was a good win for him. Casey Navarro, this is a comedy act. First class is a comedy act now. When Rich Swan was there, yeah, they were they were being goofy or whatever, but we're, we're watching first class and we're like, hey, these guys are probably going to win the tag team titles at some point. Like you, you can see that being a thing. I think actually, as a matter of fact, before Rich Swan uh, was suspended, I'm pretty sure they were on pace to win the belts. This version ain't winning shit. They could have the digital media tag team champions championships, and these motherfuckers would not win those. They're it's like a it's a a goofy gimmick now. AJ Francis was one of the best parts of the show several months ago. He was a big part. He was a featured part of the show. Like he was doing big things and involved in big angles, and he was, you know playing a role in getting others over. Like he's a, a sideshow now with this, like I've talked about this a lot, but they've just first class has completely fallen off a cliff. So they're just trying to find shit for them to do. Like they're just trying to get them on the show, but they're they're al- It's almost a waste of our time when they come on. So we knew Mike Santana was going to win this. What spend the block. We're not going to make fun of Tom Hannafin. I promise. So yeah, Mike Santana, Gets the win. After this, and this is the TNA format. Match, Gia Miller. Jesus Christ, that's perfect. Of course you're here right now. And she is with Ryan Nemeth. It should have been me. It should have been me. And the TNA world champion, Nick Nemeth. I've been talking to people walking here. We've been talking about next year, and I'm sitting there saying, I'm not going to be here. (laughs) 
So last last week, I was going to say last year, last week I was talking about there's a clear heel turn coming. I'm I'm seeing this a little bit clearer now. Nick Nemeth is still a baby face. They're kind of Nick N- Ryan Nemeth is the heel. But they're brothers, so they're still together doing their thing. I think the Nick Nemeth heel turn is going to come. I I thought it was going to come a lot quicker though. I thought it was already in in the works based off the the Bound for Glory footage they were showing backstage arguing and all that shit. Now I'm seeing, okay, it's going to be a little bit of a slower burn. I still think they're going to get there with Nick Nemeth. I don't think they're comfortable beating him, beating babyface Nick Nemeth clean. I don't think he's cool with that. So it's easier for him to justify a loss as a heel, I'd say. But I think they're definitely going that direction. And they're talking about in the main event, Nick Nemeth is going to take on Brian Myers. And then Ryan Nemeth is going to wrestle Joe Hendry. I don't mind Ryan Nemeth. I think he's pretty solid in the ring. I think his promo, his promos are fine. It's his voice that's kind of annoying, but you know, he he he's fine. I know some people don't like him, but um to me he's fine. And then they walk away, they're done with the interview, and they just leave Jim Miller standing there like a goof for like three three seconds and three, four seconds. I don't know why they do that. Well, I mean, I do. It's because they, they've they seen WWE do it. They cut an interview, the wrestler walks off, and then they leave the announcer standing there for like four seconds grinning like a fool. I I don't I, I didn't like it when WWE did it. I don't know if they still do. They do it with Gia Miller. Just cut off the fucking interview after the interview's over. I mean, it just, it's just so silly. Like, if you're watching the NBA and... Malika Andrews is interviewing James Harden and James Harden is done. He doesn't walk away. And then you just staring at the fucking interviewer for three or four seconds. That's, it's just really weird. I don't, I don't like it anyway. Let's move on from that. So they're showing a clip from, I guess it was from last week. If it happened at the end of the episode, I completely missed it. Cause I know once Moose won the title, I, I shut it off. And I remember actually um, in my head kind of commending them because I've always said they don't like to go off the air with a heel raising their hands in the air in victory. They just don't. Every time they're in a scenario where that happens, there's a, something post-match where they go off the air with that. They're, they, they're okay with Nick Nemeth, yay, rah-rah, the Hardys, all that shit, Joe Hendry. As long as there's a baby face and they've won, they'll go off the, epi- the, off the air like that. Heel wins, there's always something after. Always, always, always. So I remember kind of commending them. Oh, wow, Moose won and they're going off the air. But I didn't watch all the way through. So if this happened afterwards, that's why I didn't review it last week because I didn't see it. And what it happened, what happened was it shows um, Cheeseball Mike Bailey. Cheese. Yeah. Didn't we lock you in the dumpster one time? I got out. And I guess we'll be retiring that soundbite since he is uh, apparently AEW bound. And it and it looks like he's getting his his swan song. Like everyone is, he looks like he's done there, right? Because we know that he wrapped up the tapings here. He lost and then he's bowing to the crowd. And then uh, Trent all have a number seven comes out. I don't want lunch. I want breakfast. Clearly I wasn't talking to you big titties. You cherub-looking motherfucker. And Trent all have a number seven nut shots him and chokes him out with his scarf. So that's how I guess they're going to write Mike Bailey out of the company. And they went with a heel turn for Trent Seven. So again, if that happened last week, I completely missed it. I didn't see, you know, I'm not super active on Twitter. I didn't, but I didn't see anyone talking about it. I didn't. Or anything, no one DM me shit. Like I had absolutely no idea that that happened at the end of the show. So I'm sitting here like completely shocked by it. But um, that's what they're doing. I don't think Mike Bailey is going to put Trent Seven over on the way out. I think he's just done. So the rumor is Mike Bailey is AEW bound. You guys know I'm not really a big Cheeseball fan. Oh, Tom Hannafin made us made sure to let us know Cheeseball Fountain is dead. Anyway. I've never been a big fan of his. I've liked the matches. Don't get me wrong. Wrestling is just more than matches, you know? 
but I would say he is the guy who has consistently had the best matches in the company. You could argue him, Josh Alexander, whatever. I would say Mike Bailey is the one that every time he's wrestled, you're like, man, that's an outstanding match. I like that he did things in a ring that no one else did. You know, that's always that's always something that stands out to me with somebody. As a matter of fact, when he first signed, my guy Lewis Carlin um, sent me a DM. He's like, this is a huge signing for Impact. And I just, I kind of jokingly told him, I'll take your word for it. Because I'm looking and his name is Speedball Mike Bailey. And I said, there is no way that someone with that corny ass name can is a good wrestler. And then we started watching him and he was really, really good. Put on excellent matches. So I was like, okay, cool. Motherfucker cuts his first promo. I was like, oh my God, he can't talk. Even a little bit. And at first they were ha- he was playing like this dumb, um, who is he feuding with? Oh, man, I just, I cannot quite remember. But there was someone pretending to be his friend, I believe. I think that's what the angle was. Someone was pretending to be his friend and he was very oblivious and thought that they were friends and it worked. So at first I'm like, okay, this dude can't talk, but he's playing like a dumb, oblivious character. So so then I'm like, okay, maybe he's doing this on purpose. Man, I could w- I wish I could remember who that was with. But anyway, then that's over. And we start hearing him talk again. I'm like, he this motherfucker's promos are awful. And they've been awful in like the three com- three years or so he's been with the company. I am very worried for him if AEW, like if he's going to go be in a Continental Classic, that's a different story because he doesn't have to cut promos for that. But after that, there's no way this dude does not get lost in the shuffle over there because he's not, his speaking is, I mean, people cut some shit promos on AEW as well, but I mean, he's so underdeveloped when it comes to talking that I just cannot see where he has a prominent place on the card in AEW. So TNA was really the perfect home for him. Of course, you know, you want to, you progress in your career and you want to make a, a certain amount of money. But the way that, I, the way I see it, you've got to develop your skills first. You've got to dis- develop your skills for the big time, even if the money's there. For those of you who watch basketball, they have the one and done, right? The college freshman comes in and instead of crafting their game in college basketball, the majority of them who have real talent go to the NBA after one year. And then the teams get them and they're not even anywhere close to a finished product. And the argument is always, well, we have the G League, you know, what a great place for them to develop or they can develop in the NBA. Most of them end up out of the league very quickly. There's a dream. There's always that big dream of the big money and the bright lights. But the majority of the people who go there and aren't ready don't really develop because the teams only give them a leash of about three years to show them what they got, to, what the, you know, what they can do. And if they don't, their rookie contract doesn't get renewed. And then all of a sudden they're playing for minimum deals. That obviously doesn't happen with everyone, but it, it happens with a good a good percentage of the players. So the reason I'm using that example is that you've got these wrestlers and they're saying, well, we want to go to AEW and we want to go to WWE and we'll, we'll develop there because that's, but that's where the money is. So we're going to chase it, but what, a, what better place than to develop in, in WWE? But the thing is, once you get there, you got a short leash. Mike Bailey's going to go to AEW. He's going to have a couple months to prove he belongs as one of the main players on the on TV. If he doesn't, He's going to be in Ring of Honor with Taya Valkyrie and and Deanna Perazzo and these guys, these guys and girls. That's just that's just the way it works. You're chasing the money, and maybe there's an opportunity to develop in a bigger company, but there's more eyeballs on you, and before you know it, you're just going to be doing nothing in a company like TNA. Just like in you know, you stay in college basketball, you stay for another year. You've got clout with the company. You've got a position with the company. Everyone has a a personal connection with you, especially if you're a star player. A lot of times that's the best place to develop. 
So my whole point is he really needed to develop certain skills to his game before he went and chased the money. Mike Bennett tried to do that in TNA. He couldn't turn the WWE money down, and he was at the bottom of the card within a month when he got there. So I don't feel that this is a good transition. I think that the AEW marks are going to enjoy his matches for a while, but can you seriously imagine him in some kind of storyline there? He's just going to go there and have matches. That's what AEW does, and that I guess that's his strong point. Just don't see where he's not at the bottom of the card. Not as a jobber, but I mean, I just don't see where he's not in Ring of Honor after a couple months. I just don't see that scenario. So that'll do it for talking about the cheese ball and cheese ball fountain. So let's uh let's send him off properly. One more one more play of the sound drop. Cheese. Yeah. Didn't we lock you in a dumpster one time? I got out. I apologize. That is the second time in two weeks at the uh the intro has just kind of like randomly played in the episode. Um, I'm going to go through these settings and try to (laughs) figure out why the, why the hell it's doing that. So my apologies on that. I know that makes, it makes it come off very unprofessional and, and all that. We're going to be working on a a new intro soon. That's going to be a project of mine for 2025. So I, I, I'm going to say January 1st, 2025, we're going to have a new intro here on the channel. But again, I apologize for that because it's, not very professional that that is happening. Anyway, we got um Santino, uh, not, not Santino. Yeah, we do get Santino, but we have Gia Miller backstage again. She's with Ace Austin and the Hardys. They say about two words. Trent Seven walks up and they start with this, what's wrong with you? You know, why would you do that? And then out of nowhere, we get Hammerstone and Jake something. And I've been joking about Jake something. I've called him Naked Jake for a while because he never has clothes on. He's walking backstage in just his his trunks. Now we're getting these backstage segments with Hammerstone and Jake. And Jake has clothes on and Hammerstone's naked. When when I knew they were going to become a tag team, I said, who's going to break? Are they both going to be naked? Or is, like, is Hammerstone going to be like, oh, I got to join the party and wear nothing? Or is Jake gonna be like, oh shit, Hammerstone wears shirts. I need to wear shirts, dude. They're both they 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 did the opposite. They switched places. So anyway, he attacks him, and then we get the first appearance of Santino Morella. Sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. And I mean, this there's several Santino's on this show several times and and just show it just just happens the Gia Miller just happens to fucking be there. I know like probably 99% of you don't care about that stuff, but I always say that wrestling comes off best when it's perceived to be real. And it is so fake when Santino just happens to fucking be there all the time. And then it'll be another epi- another segment where he's in an office and they got to go find him there. Like he's just always there. It's so, it's so ridiculous. Anyway, they're they're setting up a tag team match, six man for next week. I thought it was going to be for the TNA plus show, but it's going to be for next week. That's got to be the funniest three way team in the world of one guy who has the probably worst physique on the roster teaming with the two guys who have the best physique on the roster. Oh! So we are getting Trent. I'll have a number seven with a side of catch up with Hammerstone, Naked Jake, and they'll be taking on the Hardys in Ace Austin here pretty soon. And of course, Tom Hannafin lets us know seven something and Hammerstone take out the Hardys and Ace Austin. Followed up by that segment, we got looks like a new tag team in TNA, Alan Angels and Jake Christ taking on the Rascals. In one word, would I use dope? Nope. And that is Trey Miguel and the number one championship, Zachary Wentz. I will try to look into this if the information hasn't already come out. If Jake Chris is going to be around for a while, if he's signed or, or whatever the case, because him and Alan Angels clearly have matching pants. So 
they look like they're a tag team, not just two guys thrown together. They came down together. Alan Angels did tweet out, you know, what he was asking for tag team names. You know, what should we name our team? So we'll see what happens. But it's a brand new tag team, and they are immediately beat as they uh, had a pretty good tag team match with the Rascals. I mean, these are all guys, four guys who fly around the ring, and they're the kind of matches that are great for a live crowd. But of course, the Rascals win this thing. There's just absolutely no doubt about that. This is followed by Spitfire backstage. Tell me right now that I'm just a job. Tell me to my face. You're just a job. They showed a little personality here. I still don't really like them, but they showed a little personality here. They kind of got marbles in their mouth talking, but it's it's whatever. It's they're improving. I don't remember if I said this on or on a different podcast that I was interviewed. I'm very open to enjoying Spitfire and them growing as a team and as characters. You know, I'm just not a big fan of what they do now, but I'm very very open to it. So, they showed more personality here. And they're talking about Ash and Heather by Elegance. And they're just going to com- continue to wrestle each other in one-on-one matches until Ash and Heather win a- enough matches to justify uh, wrestling for the tag team titles and winning them, of course, and then having no opponents after that. Next match was something that was supposed to take place a couple weeks ago, but they were unable to do it, so they gave it to us now. It was. The Northern Armory, Josh Alexander. I don't want to play with you anymore. Along with Kid Icarus and the wizard, Walt Williams. I'm just a job? And they took on Eric Young, king of the rah-rah. Those times where the rah-rah speeches and getting everybody up. Because nobody really get motivated off that stuff anyway. Jonathan Gresham. Inky, the octopus. And Steve Macklin. For the land of the free. Oh, and I can't count. Then, of course, twice during this match, we got Tom Hannafin with Bound for Glory. Um, I forgot, we, you know, we, we might as well let everyone know that Eric Young is also the star of the hit. TV show Vinyl Obsession. I'm here to tell you right now, we don't care. Let me tell you, right, let me tell you <laughs> we don't care. So very, very good six-man tag team match. As I said, this was something we were supposed to get a couple weeks ago. Kid Icarus and the wizard Walt Williams ran into some travel issues, and uh, we're getting it now. I will say I like the Northern Armory's look. I like the, the matching jackets. Sinner and Saint needed this. They're 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 good in the ring. We haven't really heard them talk a whole lot. The problem is they look like two guys you hire from Home Depot to deliver and install your washer and dryer. So, with that being said, throwing the jackets on here and just creating the stable is probably the best thing that could have happened for them. And I'm enjoying the Northern Armory so more uh, so far. The Northern Armory Armory as uh, as Jade announced them. I'm enjoying them so far. The match went a little long for me. I thought at one point that uh, the Northern Armory, or Sinner and Stain, I should say, hit uh, hit their finisher. I believe it was called Sun and Silence. And I was at first I said that should have been the, the finish because they just kind of kept going after that. And it actually slowed down the match and took the crowd out of it because – when you build up to something and then you kind of what it, when it's perceived that you unnecessarily took the finish away, it's it can be kind of difficult to get. Initially, I said well, that was that should have been the finish. Now you're just going to keep fucking wrestling and we're watching AEW. That's at first how I took it. But what ended up happening was they started teasing dissension between. Not dissension because Steve Macklin, instead of allowing Eric Young to hit the elbow drop and, and do what they needed to do to win the match, he was using his anger towards Josh Alexander to just keep hitting him and attacking him. And I thought they were going to disqualify him. But then, then with that, they tease a little dissension with him and Eric Young, which I think has been obvious this whole time ever since they kind of teamed up. 
because it was very, very random. I think that it was obvious at some point there was going to be some kind of turn or or something like that. I, I, I don't know, but there was always there's always in the back of your mind that there's going to be some kind of dissension between the two. I don't see them being like a tag team. They would make a great tag team because we need tag teams. But I don't think that's what they're doing. So they they were there was a little more story to the match. So then I said, okay, that yeah, even though that should have been the finish, because they hit the move on Jonathan Gresham. It wasn't like they were, you know, pinning Steve Macklin. Uh I was I was okay with them kind of continuing the match because it was furthering the storyline between Eric Young and Macklin. And you know, we'll see where that goes. Um after the end of that match, we had King of the block party, Frankie Kazarian. It's a block party. I'm not playing with y'all, bro. And he's got his Call Your Shot Gauntlet trophy. And they were talking about showing when Rhino beat him. I th- I completely missed that. If they showed some kind of old clip of Rhino beating him, I, I didn't see it. I had no idea what he was talking about. But I do know Frankie Kazarian pinned him in the Call Your Shot Gauntlet with a low blow because for whatever reason, the goof ref had his back away from the action. I don't remember exactly why. And then uh, the convenience store machine, Rhino walked up and they're going to have a match next week. Next on the card is Joe Hendry. Believe that. Versus the Hollywood hunk, Ryan Nemeth. It should have been me. It should have been so Joe Hendry's talking in the beginning of this, and they are referring to last week when he played the episode about the accolades of Ryan Nemeth, and it was a video that was about four seconds long. Everyone loved it. So this time around, he says he's going to play the longer extended version, the director's cut, and he plays it, and it's the same exact video. And then at that point, he probably knew the crowd was going to stay one more time because they did last time. He just wasn't ready for it, so they couldn't play it again. They knew it was coming, so he said, let's play it again. So they're building a lot of heat on Ryan Nemeth. Again, he's the he's clear clearly a heel in this now. TNA brought him on. They try to, you know, hey, we, we brought the guy with the Nemeth name, and he's a baby face and all that shit. Clearly, they're using, he's a heel now. That is the best role for him they had a match we knew who was going to win joe hendry ultimately did the match was fine it was two guys with some size so i i can get with that Um, but joe hendry gets the win as we knew he would this is followed by knockouts action rosemary i know what cankles are rosemary doesn't have them and she took on the returning jada stone doesn't even go here she was one that um, she wrestled before, very athletic. Of course, all the TNA fans got on Twitter saying, sign Jada Stone. They probably did here as well. Since they brought her back, there's, there's a possibility they're really looking at her. I thought last time that she wrestled that she was, she reminded me of Naomi. Like She was very athletic, but it was it was sloppy to me and it came off a little dangerous. But I thought she looked um, better here. She's she's definitely got some some talent to her. Like that's she is someone you you can work with that, you know. So we'll see what happens. We'll see if she's someone that um, s- sticks around or not. I thought she got a little too much offense in, but I think that's because again they they're looking at her, so they can't just if they if they straight up just squash someone, they're not looking at them. You know what I mean? Um, but if they get a little offense in, it's they're trying to see what they can do. So we're not going to make fun of Tom this episode, but Matthew Raywall. Hey, man, I really appreciate that Patrick Price on my insurance, Jake, from State Farm. He's using Tom Hannafin terminology here. and Like stuff is rubbing off on, on Matt Raywall. And I said last week, it always sounds like they have a word of the week that they got to, you know, they're, they challenge themselves. The word of the day dictionary, the word of the week, whatever. Is this we got to get into the episode? So this one was dispatch, and this and Hannafin has used this before. He'd be like, you know, um, Santana dispatches Eddie Edwards. So here, Matthew Raywall is saying Rosemary Rosemary is looking to dispatch Jada Stone. 
I'm here, look at her. And then he said, because last week when she, when he, he got, again, he doubles down on it. Last week when he dispatches Wendy, when she, excuse me, last week when she dispatched Wendy Chu, and then he starts, burr, burr. and I'm like, what is the fucking upset? So I had to look it up. Dispatch, Dic- def- uh, dictionary definition to deal with, to deal with a task or problem or opponent. So the, sh- the word makes sense. But who fucking talks like that? You know what I'm saying? Like, especially to, to, to throw it in twice. When, you're dis- when she dispatched Wendy Chu last week. I mean, come on, Wendy Chu. She doesn't even go here. Anyway, Rosemary obviously wins this match. And we move on after that. Alicia Edwards comes out. Uh, hi, baby. And I said this before. She's she is beating it to death. You want to know something? I, I think it's a good line. I think she's doing very very good work as a as a heel. But I think she is beating that to death. It's going to become like more of a comedy thing if she doesn't keep you know instead of drawing heat. But she comes out. She she cuts a pretty long heel promo here. And I was thinking to myself, has anyone improved their status in the company over the past year as Alicia Edwards has? When I say the status, I just mean like their overall character, their overall spot on the show. You know, you, we would go weeks at a time without Alicia being on there. People were always talking about her acting. And when she was back, backstage and she was talking and it was fake and it was unbelievable. She's cutting these heel promos and these are excellent. She's she's getting like really good heat. So um I, I'm proud with how far they've come. They the system now has rings, which I think is was genius. And they even promoted that on Impact Plus, I think they're gonna show the ring ceremony. So I'm I'm gonna check that out. Impact Plus YouTube. I don't I don't really know. I'll look it up. But I think the rings are a great idea because I was mentioning last week that the system works best when there's gold involved. You know, like if they're just a heel, they're OVE. They're, you you know, if there's, if there's no, if no one has championships, they're just a group that is going out there, not accomplishing anything. It works for them when someone's got a belt. At first one point it was only Alicia right now. It's only Moose. At one point it was only Eddie and and Brian Meyer. So that's what kind of works for them. And just giving them the ring. It's, I mean, now WWE is letting us know that, Hey, rings mean championships. I think that's a great touch. I think they're going to use them in matches. You know, I can very much see that happening, but I think it's a great touch of saying, hey, we have another accolade. It's a self-given accolade. You know, it's almost like someone creating a title for themselves and wearing it around. So I think it was a very, very good idea. So she's talking, and then we get the knockouts world champion, Masha Slamovich. Meet Fran Stalinaskovich Davidovitsky. She comes out and um, challenges Alicia next week in a match where she's going to put the knockouts championship on the line. Guess what the stipulation is? It's fucking no disqualification. Get that out of here! So we had no, no disqualification last week, and we're going to get no disqualification next week. We're getting a garbage match because Alicia cannot hang with Masha Slamovich in the ring. We already know that. So they got to make it a garbage match. That is that is how they bridge the gap between the talent level of two wrestlers. So I was interested in the match. I'm always interested when they say, hey, Alicia's going to wrestle. I'm always into that. But as soon as the words came out, no disqualification, I said, here we fucking go. And then we get Tasha Steeles. We've got a badass over here. And then shortly wearing... I think roses on her. I don't know what the hell she was wearing. It was Jordan Grace. Get me out of here! Because they just got to get Jordan on the show at this point. Like there's, they're just they're just forcing people onto the show. I don't think they were really necessary for this, but well, no, it was necessary because Jordan was saying, "Well, I, I'm I'm do a rematch." So yeah, I, I kind of take back what I was saying. 
she did come out and said, well, I'm, I'm doing a rematch. So whichever, whichever of the two of you wins, and I have a good idea who it's going to be, we all do. We all do, Jordan. I hadn't watched the episode yet, but when I saw the graphic out with Masha and Alicia on one side saying Masha or Alicia versus Jordan Grace at Turning Point, I mean, get the fuck out of here. We, we know exactly what the match is going to be. It looks like they're not going to stretch Jordan out until Genesis, which I guess is fine. Whatever. Um, she is, uh, she's been on NXT. They say her contract is up in January. Maybe it's up January 1st, but she is, she's ready to go. Get me out of here. As soon as this is over, Tom Hannafin lets us know, let's, Look at the matches for next week. And they have a video package for the match that was just announced 10 seconds ago between Masha and Alicia. Little details there, folks. Little details. After they run down this card, it shows Ryan Nemeth on the ground hurt with a real doctor. I would imagine he is at least. And, uh, you know... Ryan is attending to him because earlier in the night, he said, I, w- I will be there. I got your back. But because Ryan Nemeth is now a heel, they can't really have him go out there and save Nick Nemeth. So they kind of had to write him out of the angle. Guess who the fuck walks up? Sometimes may be good. Sometimes may be shit. But speaking of that, I actually, I think I missed this. I think this happened earlier in the show. And I did. It was, I'm sorry. I, I do this every week. I always skip over something. When Joe Hendry, after Joe Hendry beat Nick Nemeth, Steve Macklin is running around backstage. He starts walking down a pair, a, a, a set of stairs. And guess who the fuck is at the bottom of the stairs? Sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. And he's like, oh, perfect. Whatever he said. Like, he's He said something about, Josh Alexander, fix it. And then he walks up, and this is not a locker room. This is like the basement of the fucking building. Guess who's standing there? The star of Vinyl Obsession, Eric Young. He's just there, and they start arguing. Jonathan Gresham, like, "Ah, I don't want nothing to do with this. I'm just here to wrestle good matches. Let me walk out of this storyline. And we just got, got a lot of Santino this episode. And this motherfucker is just, just there at all times. Then we got the main event of this program, which was a non-title match, Brian Myers. What is she going to think when she comes in here? Oh, look, he's got a billion toys. And he has taken on the TNA world champion, Nick Nemeth. I've been talking to people walking here. We've been talking about next year, and I'm sitting there saying, I'm not going to be here. <laughs> and Tom Hannafin is making sure to let us, to, re- to constantly remind us about their jobber days in WWE. The kick out. And I guess uh, Nick Nemeth beat him in seven seconds. Dolph Ziggler beat Kurt Hawkins in seven minutes or seven seconds with a super kick. So they're doing that because they're trying to tell a story because Nick Nemeth tried to hit a super kick right when the match started. So I kind of get the what they're trying to do there, but trying to say this is their first matchup in seven years. Like, I mean, they were two jobbers back then. I, I don't even know why you're you're bringing that up. You're you're trying to these guys have been rebranded, recreated, reimagined, repackaged. You know, like why are we bringing that shit up, especially with Brian Myers? Because it took a while to get that stigma away from Brian Myers that he was this big loser in WWE for a long time. You know, it's I don't understand why they would bring that up or whatever, but they have a match and um, it's fine. It's like I said earlier, it's two guys with size. So, you know, I, I can get with the match, but we knew where it was going. Oh, and I can't count. Nick Nemeth ultimately wins the match. And the whole time they've got Joe Hendry on commentary. Believe that. And he let us know that he is going to be in the Thanksgiving Turkey Bowl. So they are making Joe Hendry start from the bottom, okay? And and the bottom in TNA means 
wrestle one or two matches and then get a title shot. That it, it, it like he is not. I you know I, I've brought up the Mickey James example before where she's doing the last ro- rodeo and she's like, I'm going to wrestle every knockout on this roster. And she has three matches, not even hers, half the division. And then she gets her title shot. So that's, what's going to happen here too. Nick Nemeth is going to wrestle. <coughs> sorry, not Nick Nemeth. Uh, Joe Hendry going to wrestle in the Thanksgiving Turkey bowl. He's obviously not going to wear the Turkey suit. Um, and he's going to beat one other jobber and then he's going to get his world title match. So that's, Mark my words, that's exactly where this shit is is going. Um, wrestling in the Turkey Bowl match, that is the only thing lower than that is wrestling for the Digital Media Championship. So that really is at the bottom. He is he is starting in the gutter. He's a comedy character in a comedy match, so I guess it works. But I'm not against it. However, when three months ago when Spitfire lost because the goof referee wasn't looking and the militia were able to cheat and win they somehow because they cheated got their title match but here in this bound for glory match where john layfield was clearly involved frankie kazarian was clearly involved like this was not a clean win by nick nemeth over joe hendry there was clearly shenanigans and fuckery going on but santino can't give Joe Hendry a title match? The line, if it's a clean win, like if Nick, they just had a match and Nick Nemeth beat him, well, it's like, hey, you don't get a title match. And that makes all the sense in the world. And then Joe Hendry can say, okay, well, I'm going to start at the bottom. But he really, he actually deserves a rematch. You know what I'm saying? Especially because Nick Nemeth, the fighting champion, wants to give it to him. Nick Nemeth, for a while, was just fighting anyone who wanted to wrestle for the title. So, that's where all, all kind of like doesn't make sense. But as I said, Nick Nemeth wins a match. We know he's going to win the match. He wins. You know, at one point, Joe Hendry took Alicia away because the system always gets involved. That's just what the fuck they do. So there's a post-match beatdown because that is what happens with the system. It happens every single time. We mean that because they needed uh, Joe Hendry to return with the Kendo Spicks the kendo stick and dispatch the system so that they could start building a little heat between the two of them in the ring because Joe Hendry almost hit him with the stick and then Nick Nemeth almost hit him with the super kick. So they're trying to build a little heat between the two, which is perfectly fine. So that's how we go off the air. Uh, we got a lot of Joe Hendry on this episode, a lot of Nick Nemeth, a lot of Santino. Uh, but that's, that's, that's what it was. That will do it for me, folks. I'm going to be, my wife's out of town for a couple of days. So I think tonight, today, I'm going to try to do my, I'm going to do my best to wrap up that Maple Leaf Pro night too. A lot of people messaged me and they said, you're going to love Maple Leaf Pro. And I'm I'm not saying it. I don't like it. It's just a hard watch for me. It is not something that I'm watching and it's just like super easy to take in and it's just flowing. Like it's, I I, I don't know. but. I'm going to do my best to watch it today so I can get that reaction video out of the way. I'm going to try to do a fairly short mailbag episode here. I took a couple of questions on Twitter. So we will try to make that happen as well. So thanks for hanging with me as usual, folks. I will talk to you next week. And you'll see my face too. I'm out. Peace.